Hi everybody. This is going to be a video that's about the modernization of game music. Uh, we talk a lot in this class about the 80s. We talk a lot about retro audio and this video is going to fill in a lot of the gaps that happen really in the 1990s. The 1990s are the decade that brings us from the retro audio of the early to mid 1980s uh, all the way up into the modern era. By 2000 or so, or, or shortly thereafter, you basically have in place all of the game sound technologies that are still in use today. So to recap, early game sound, as we heard, often relied on very simple improvised solutions. Um, simple buzzers that could only produce one pitch at a time, uh, you had hard-coded sound effects, you know, early games like Pong were really, really kind of analog circuit design rather than code. Um, and the sound solutions that developers created were very, very simple and very limited. Um, often built right alongside the arcade cabinets, custom designed as they needed. Uh, arcade games also sometimes would get creative. They would use existing sources of sound. Uh, they'd use technologies like 8-track tapes or laser discs. Uh, they would do custom things like the famous wooden block in Kubert that would fall, you know, that would whack the side of the cabinet when your character fell to the ground. Then after that, in the 1980s, uh, or even the late 70s, we get into programmable sound generators. That is, simple sequencers uh, that bring a little bit of synthesis to home consoles like the NES. Uh, so we study the Nintendo in depth. You remember it has three melodic channels, you know, two pulse waves and one triangle wave to give two different sounds. It has a white noise channel and a very simple one-bit sampler. So programmable sound generators allow game developers to have some uh, synthesized music, there are enough channels that you can sort of do melody and bass or melody and counterpoint. counterpoint. You can have sound effects be creatively produced by, by one or more of the channels. Uh, so you have some flexibility and freedom, but at the same time you're making sacrifices like having a limited number of channels, having a limited number of notes on at once, having to drop out the melody or drop out the harmony when you want to use one of the channels momentarily for a sound effect. Uh, so there are still a lot of limitations on programmable sound generators into the 1980s, well into the mid-80s. So the late 80s and the 1990s are going to see a lot of different advances in sound technology, and they really bring about the modern era that we enjoy today. So a few of those points that I'll hit today uh, include FM synthesis or frequency modulation synthesis, uh, MIDI sound cards, both of which are, are ways of using FM synthesis, uh, CD audio, and then the sort of compressed audio formats that are going to bring us into modern uh, game sound and game music and that are still used today. So, uh, FM synthesis. So you'll remember these early programmable sound generators generate a single waveform at a time. So you've got the square wave or the triangle wave, for example, on the Nintendo. You see the red diagram is a square wave. Um, the blue one on the bottom there is a triangle wave. Uh, we call these very simple waveforms. They're simple, they're mathematically regular. In fact, the green sine wave is a very, very common mathematical function. But they produce, as you remember, very simple tones, um, tones that have some musical qualities to them, but they don't necessarily sound like uh, real instruments. Uh, you know, a sine wave is pure, a square wave or triangle wave has different sorts of attack and decay. Uh, they don't really sound like real instruments. Uh, but what FM synthesis does is it allows you to generate multiple waveforms at once. Uh, so an FM synthesis chip will use, you know, four to six different oscillators. You know, an oscillator is what produces the sound in a synthesizer. All sound is based on vibration, so you need something that actually produces it. 
and uh, as opposed to a simple single wave synthesizer, FM synthesis would use a series of different waves at once um, to combine at different strengths at different partials. You know the sound of a real instrument uh, is characterized by a lot of different frequencies at once. This is something we talked about in the very first week of the class. Um, but what makes, for example, a trumpet sound different from a clarinet is that the waveform actually sounds different. Um, there are different harmonics, different partials that emerge at different strengths, and that's what gives one of these tones its characteristic uh, sound here. So you can hear or see in the trumpet wave here, for example, there are three distinct uh, pitches going on. You've got your large fundamental, and then you have two higher register things, and then the pattern repeats. So you see that there are essentially three pitches that kind of blend audibly into one, one single time through the wavelength here. Then if you look at the clarinet above, it's much more complicated. There are, what is that, seven different peaks going on. Um, so seven different frequencies. There are more frequencies that are active. Um, there's sort of a different distribution. You see that there are several stronger uh, on the lower end, and then as you get higher, there are a couple of weaker ones. These all combine to produce the clarinet timbre. So what FM synthesis does um, is it uses multiple oscillators to create multiple pitches. Uh, it modulates the strength or uh, the distribution of those pitches, and it imitates waveforms like these. It imitates the sound of a trumpet much, much better than, um, than a single waveform ever could. Uh, and so FM synthesis is really what drives the, synthesizer, the, the synthesizers of the 1980s. You listen to a Yamaha synthesizer on uh, you know, an 80s music video, and you're hearing FM synthesis. So, FM synthesis is used in sort of the next generation of console games to come along after the Nintendo. For example, the Sega Genesis, which was called the Mega Drive outside of North America. The Sega Genesis has a more sophisticated sound system than the original Nintendo did. There's only a few years between them. The original Nintendo hardware came out in 1983, so this is five years later. Um, you have a four-channel wave synthesizer that's basically used for sound effects. Um, you know, so that alone is the capability of the Nintendo. Um, three melodic channels, one noise channel, um, and that's going to be set aside in the Genesis basically for sound effects. Then you're left with six full channels of stereo music, um, FM synthesis. This allows the Genesis to imitate real instruments. You hear basses, you hear drums, you hear uh, guitars and pianos and things like that. You hear real instrumental textures being simulated in Genesis music. And then finally, an 8-bit sampler that is much higher resolution than the 1-bit sampler that the Nintendo Entertainment System has. So I'm going to play a little clip from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Here you're going to be able to hear just how much more sophisticated the musical texture is. You can hear percussion, you can hear uh, bass, you can hear melody and counterpart, counterpoint, and they all sound more, more or less like real instruments. They're obviously synthesized, they're obviously sort of a, a product of the 80s, uh, but there's a lot more going on, a lot less left to the imagination in the Genesis music. Then you'll hear as the game is played, there's plenty of space for sound effects. You no longer have the effect where one melodic channel has to go silent, or you have to choose between two sound effects, what's going to be sounded at the time. Um, the Genesis can layer these sounds on top of one another with no problem.
that was an example of what happened in console games in the late 80s into the 90s. The Super Nintendo would imitate this same technology. Um, it's kind of of the same generation as the Genesis. Uh, let's move into computer gaming now. So the major innovation in the late 80s for computer sound is the sound card. And a sound card is a dedicated board that actually goes inside a computer um, and it essentially provides all of these sound processing capabilities right there on the board. You see a very famous example here, the Sound Blaster 16 um, by Creative Labs. You see how it's got its own processing chip on there separate from the CPU of the computer. Um, a lot of other processes that kind of go on. A sound card can handle recording, audio output, it has FM synthesis built in, usually in many, many channels. It can kind of assist the computer with some of the processing, some of the memory that's necessary to uh, either record or play back uh, high resolution digital sound effects. So sound cards in the 1980s when they come out, the late 80s, are a huge improvement on computer sound. Um, before sound cards were around, PC sound was basically limited to uh, a series of buzzers. You know, the PC speaker was essentially not that much more sophisticated than the little tiny piezo buzzer that comes in your Arduino kit. You know, it was a little bit better than that. It worked better. You know, the build quality is better, so the sound is a lot nicer. Um, but it was essentially that. It was a little transducer that could take electrical inputs and uh, use that to create pitch. Um, I'll play just a little example of a game. This is a game called Paratrooper from 1982. This is a little JS Bach piece that's actually used as its, as its introduction, and this is being played on a PC speaker. You'll hear there's only one track going on at once. So obviously, sound cards uh, with their synthesis capabilities, with the ability to play back audio, are going to be a huge improvement on that. Uh, so sound cards, as we know them, emerge in the late 80s, around 1987 or so. And they bring with them the capability to do FM synthesis. They have oscillators built right in, uh, and circuits to handle that. They serve as interfaces to external hardware, um, you know, it wasn't until sound cards came along that you could actually plug your headphones into your computer. Um, you could also now hook up external speakers to your computer. Um, this obviously is going to be the precursor to playing music on your computer, which would emerge in the 1990s. Uh, a couple of significant models or manufacturers include the AdLib, uh, Roland, which had a big series of sound cards. Roland is an actual keyboard maker. Um, and they made sound cards. Creative Labs, I already mentioned the Sound Blaster, which is sort of the iconic game-changing uh, sound card, and the Gravis Ultrasound. These all came out in the last couple of years in the 1980s. And so initially when sound cards emerged, it actually mattered what brand you had. Different manufacturers would use different standards. They had slightly different capabilities. Um, so a game in the late 80s, early 90s needed to be written uh, with drivers to support several different brands of sound cards. Uh, there, was not, there was not a standard way to interface with these things, so you had to make sure that your game could work with an AdLib and a Roland and a Sound Blaster. Sometimes if you, for example, had a less popular brand that had a lot less support, um, you might just be out of luck. A game might not support what you have. Um, so this situation we don't really run into anymore. Um, the, the confusing situations with sound cards and with video cards as well, where every manufacturer made their own drivers, had their own capabilities, had their own scripting languages and things like that. Um, all of this sort of went away when game developers started to use standardized libraries. So for example, Microsoft's DirectX uh, it's still around today. It's in like DirectX 14 by now or something like that, maybe even more. Um, DirectX was a, an attempt 
to standardize the way that a game would interface with sound and video hardware. It was a set of drivers where all you had to do is make sure that your game was DirectX compatible, and then it would work with any sound card, any video card, any computer that was compatible with DirectX. So the situation where different sound cards could do different things sort of went away in the 1990s when DirectX came out, and it's not something we worry about anymore with PC gaming. Another related technology to talk about is MIDI. Now MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, um, and it's, it's a, a programming standard. MIDI is not in, on its own a sound producing technology, it's more a language, a set of standards, uh, a prescription for how to handle data with music and sound. It's a standard way of controlling and mediating between uh, sound cards, keyboards, computers, other musical hardware. A lot of musical hardware since the 80s uh, runs on MIDI. It still does today. Um, so MIDI is a, is a way of communicating. It's not exactly a sound quality on its own. You'll frequently hear people refer to FM synthesis as MIDI. Because that's not quite accurate. MIDI is the language. MIDI is the data that drives that synthesizer. Um, you know, if you hook MIDI input up to a really nice synthesizer, it's going to sound a lot better than a cheap one. A modern synthesizer, it's going to sound a lot better than an old one. It's all still MIDI. Um, MIDI translates from music notation into computerized sound and vice versa. So a MIDI keyboard these days, for example, can record the things that you play into your keyboard, bring it into your notation software and render it in, in music notation, or it can play from a score or from music notation and it can play out to a speaker or synthesizer or headphones um, out that way. So MIDI is a two-way street for musical data. And uh, the way that it works essentially is to make everything numerical. It, it takes every aspect of music that its creators could think of and it standardizes them and it prescribes exactly, you know, this is the scale that we're going to treat loudness on from, you know, zero to whatever. Uh, this is the way we're going to treat pitch. This is the way we're going to treat rhythm and meter and tempo. Um, so these effects can be manipulated as data, as code, um, just like we talked about in the Music as Code segments of this course. Um, MIDI can convey up to 16 channels of information. That means it can have 16 simultaneous instruments, although if you have that many, there are very slight delays in how MIDI data is transmitted. Um, but theoretically, up to 16 channels. So I'm going to switch windows right now and look at just one or two of the ways that MIDI standardizes that information. So for example, MIDI prescribes exactly how to refer to a note. Um, you'll see here on this keyboard, if I zoom in, um, there are actually a bunch of numbers from 0 to 127. That's 128 total that start low at zero, and each note as you go up, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. Um, so every unique note has a MIDI value, and MIDI will just refer to a note by saying, this is note number 46, and it's that B flat. You know, this is note number 51, it's that E flat um, in that specific octave. If we zoom out here, you kind of see that the, uh, the range of MIDI actually goes below a standard piano, above a standard piano. You're never going to actually use those notes, um, but it's kind of nice that they're there. Uh, so thank you to uh, Hinton Instruments for providing this diagram. Another thing that MIDI standardizes is synthesizer voices. Um, you know, as I mentioned, FM synthesis is sort of the technology that carries this synthesis out that makes it possible by using multiple tones blended together to imitate different instruments. But MIDI provides a whole standard here. Again, 128 different options. 
and it prescribes exactly, you know, instrument number seven is going to be the harpsichord always, and that lets you mediate between different sets of hardware. If it's MIDI compliant, um, you can always expect that when you call for, you know, what is it, instrument number 31, if you want a distorted guitar, you can say instrument 31, and whatever computer, whatever synthesizer you play it on, it's going to try to make that uh, distorted guitar sound. Now, every sound card is different, every computer is different, every keyboard is different, so the quality actually varies. One, uh, one synthesizer's distorted guitar may not be quite as nice as another one, but it's always going to be that. You're never going to call for instrument 31 and have it come out a saxophone. So MIDI standardizes that as well. Um, if you look at this list, I'm sure you'll see a lot of familiar things. If you've ever had a keyboard at home, if you've ever spent any time with GarageBand, for example, um, MIDI here really dictates the different kinds of sounds that are available. There are always going to be several different types of piano, several types of mallet percussion, several different kinds of organ, you know, and so on and so forth, several guitar sounds. Uh, MIDI dictates that, whether it's on a, a Casio keyboard at home, or GarageBand, or a professional audio setup. Let's watch and listen to an example of MIDI and FM synthesis in action. Um, so I'm going to play a clip from a game called TIE Fighter. And TIE Fighter is a very well-known, uh, famous game by LucasArts. Uh, it comes in the mid-1990s, sort of during the Star Wars revival. You know, after Return of the Jedi came out in 1983, Star Wars dropped off the radar for a little bit until people once again started writing novels, started putting out toys in the 1990s. And this series of LucasArts games came out then as well. TIE Fighter, um, as you might be able to guess from the name, uh, actually casts you as one of the bad guys. You're an Imperial pilot here. So you'll hear that a lot of the battle music is sort of using the motifs of the Imperial March. Um, and it's sort of transformed and pepped up so that it's actually, you know, it's the good guy music in this context. LucasArts was really well known in the 90s for this technology that they called iMuse. And iMuse is sort of a system for creating and patching together MIDI soundtracks that would reflect the action of the game. Um, you know, the nice thing about synthesis, even if it doesn't quite sound as good as a real recording, is that when you're running things on a synthesizer, all still is code and it can still be manipulated. So what you'll hear in this example is a lot of uh, little melodic and musical fragments that kind of jump in at the right time. Um, the game is very very good at saying okay we need this event and it's going to very quickly come up with a little transition from almost wherever it is within the soundtrack and it's going to play a little fanfare or it's going to change to a different section. Um, we won't hear all the different options here in this clip, but uh, TIE Fighter has sort of standard, you know, beginning of the game, nothing is happening, you're just flying through space, it's very serene, you know, then the enemies show up, the battle music starts, it gets tense, it can play battle music for a long, long time, it kind of segues from one segment into the next, um, and then it's got a repertoire of, you know, Something good just happened to you. Something bad just happened to you. Uh, friendly reinforcements arrived. Yay! Enemy reinforcements arrived. Oh no! Um, you know, you've succeeded. You get triumphant music at the end of the mission. If you've failed your mission, you get, uh, you know, sort of sad music because you failed. You get sad music when your ship gets blown up, um, for example. So, the MIDI is used to great effect to create a dynamic soundtrack, a responsive soundtrack that uh, plays little fragments of music based on what you do. So what you'll hear here is, uh, you know, a lot of actual sampled sound effects and then a lot of FM synthesized music, which is being driven by MIDI. The particular things you'll hear is that you'll hear the rebel fanfare when more rebel ships arrive. Um, and you'll hear 
little sort of Imperial March fanfares whenever the player shoots down an enemy. There's the cruiser Lulfla. The rebels can't escape now. This is Transport Sigma beginning attack on the cruiser. What you just heard, as I mentioned, doesn't just have synthesized music, it has actual, you know, sound effects of lasers and engines and, uh, and things like that. Um, so sound effects in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, began to be stored as actual sound samples. You'll remember that sound effects, most sound effects at least on the original Nintendo, were synthesized. Mario jumping, picking up coins, things like that are actually created sort of semi-musically. Um, not so in modern games. Um, by the 1990s, people were using actual recorded sound effects. Um, because of sort of issues with memory and how large a file had to be, these things were still usually short. You would have short sound effects stored as actual audio files while you were synthesizing your soundtrack. Um, because in order to store that amount of music, uh, it would require a lot of, of uh, data. The TIE Fighter example that you just heard, um, the original game came with sound effects but no speech because speech was way too big to fit on a series of floppy disks that would have been used to sell the game in the early 90s. Um, TIE Fighter has a special edition CD version that came out a couple of years later once CD-ROMs became very prevalent around 1995. Uh, so that actually allows you to store speech samples. Um, but the early 90s, it's still this transitional point where you have some sound effects that are recorded, usually a limited number, um, and then you're synthesizing your music. Eventually, as I said, games would use uh, CDs to store media files, both speech and music, um, particularly video. Uh, a big fad in the 1990s was full motion video, where you'd have games that used video clips as the first cutscenes, for example. But you'll actually see games in the 1990s that use multiple CDs. A CD can hold about 650 megabytes of data. Um, and you see games in, for example, the Wing Commander series that are four or five discs long because they need to store that many video files. So short musical clips can be saved very easily on CDs as data, but another strategy that game developers sort of uh, used in the 1990s was CD audio. Uh, a lot of times this is called Red Book Audio because the technical manual that spells out how a CD player should work is red. Um, so sometimes it's called Red Book Audio, but it's basically CD audio. Uh, and game CD-ROMs could actually be encoded with music in standard CD format. This is called a mixed mode CD, 
and uh, it basically produces a disk where the first track holds the game data. Uh, and tracks two and up in the CD uh, will hold the music. So if you were to put the CD into your computer, your computer knows to read track one and it reads the CD-ROM data. But if you put this CD into a stereo, um, nothing will happen if you play track one, or some CD players would actually produce some static or horrible noises if you did track one. Uh, but usually nothing would happen. Then when you go to track two, you can actually play the music. So what happened with games that used CD audio is the data would be on track one, and the data would either be installed, you know, copied to the computer, or it would be loaded into memory. And as you were playing the game, the computer could then switch over and read the CD as a regular audio CD. Um, so that the soundtrack was being sort of played right off of the CD while the game itself was being held in memory. Um, so obviously this gives you the ability to create a full soundtrack. You can have six, ten, you know, twenty music selections on a CD, as many as you can fit in your 74 minutes. Um, it allows much, much higher quality. You know, CD quality audio is still some of the best, you know, consumer audio that's available, um, often better than compressed formats. You know, it's better than what you hear on Spotify these days. Um, so CD audio offered much, much higher quality. This ushered in the era of using uh, real popular music recordings, you know, FIFA and Madden and Tony Hawk uh, would would basically be mix CDs. They'd be using real recordings. You could have real orchestras playing for your Star Wars game instead of MIDI uh, once people developed CD audio for games, and they'd be really high quality. The other fun trick that you actually could pull off in the late 90s was that the game would be loaded into memory so that the CD drive could be used to, uh, to read the music. So what you could actually do is once your game was loaded and once it was running, you could take that CD out and you could put in any CD and listen to that CD as you played your game. It was kind of a fun trick that, uh, that people used to do in the, in the late 90s. Finally, the last sound side effect is that uh, games effectively became their own soundtrack albums as well. This was a, a development for the history of video game music because now you could take your CD-ROM of Command & Conquer or Wing Commander 4 or whatever and uh, play it in a regular CD player as well. You could take the soundtrack with you, you could relive the game while you weren't playing it. Uh, so that was another nice side effect. Finally, we get into the era of uh, regular wave audio or compressed audio. Um, this kind of emerges, as I said, there were a lot of recorded sound effects. There are, there are a lot of different audio files that have sort of different levels of quality and take up different amounts of space. But really the watershed format for compressed digital audio is MP3. Uh, MP3 comes out in 1993, and it's a very, very popular compression standard. So it's actually short for MPEG, which is the Moving Picture Experts Group. It's one of these groups uh, of sort of industry representatives and scientists that comes together to determine standards of, you know, how a CD player is going to work, how a DVD is going to work, um, how an audio format is going to work. And uh, so it's the, the third version of audio encoding, um, MPEG 1 layer 3, I think is what it actually uh, means. So MP3 is very, very successful because it's a very small file format that still sounds really good. And so MP3 is actually very sneaky in that it discards a huge amount of data from the original recording, but uh, it actually is mostly discarding data that we can't hear. Um, so it's discarding a lot of the frequencies, the low and the high, that the human ear has trouble perceiving. Uh, and so you can actually get rid of a huge amount of data with very little signal loss. Essentially, we barely notice that that data is gone, that those frequencies are gone. 
um, so that lets MP3 be very, very small. You know, it's sort of a megabyte a minute of uh, compression. So suddenly, instead of having, you know, instead of needing hundreds of megabytes for music, uh, you could very easily put full music tracks right alongside your game on the CD-ROM. Um, so this essentially brings us up to today. You know, there are different formats. You know, your iTunes uses a sort of private Apple version of MP3 compression. There are other um, other types of highly compressed files. But basically, this brings us up to the present day, the late 90s, um, when people started to use compressed audio to just store music files right alongside their audio files. Um, that brings us into the era of the Xbox modern PC gaming, where everything is a digital sample, everything is uh, recorded in high fidelity, and stored with really no problem. Um, you know, for a while we were putting games on DVD, on computers, um, disc games on the Xbox and the PlayStation are still variations on consumer DVDs. They hold a huge amount of data, something close to five gigabytes of data. Um, so there's more than enough space for a lot of high quality audio. Uh, and that really brings us up to the present, where we have a situation where the audio fidelity is so good, the um, storage requirements are so minimal, that essentially the sky is the limit. Um, there are very few limitations on the quality of your audio, the length of your soundtrack. You know, you can have hours of music and hundreds of voice clips and thousands of sound effects in uh, a major video game today without worrying about space or resources at all. Um, so effectively, there hasn't been as much substantive change in video game sound technology in the last 15 or 20 years as there was in the 15 years before that, you know, taking us back to the Nintendo, and then the decades leading up to that, where essentially video game sound was invented from scratch and moved all the way up to the programmable sound generators. So in a way, the, the pace of sort of game-changing innovation has slowed. Um, I won't say that we've plateaued, but that, you know, we really haven't built that much on the technology that was available 15 or 20 years ago. It's just been incremental improvement. The sampling rates get better. The storage gets better. The quality gets higher um, incrementally. But that's sort of is where this aspect of the class is going to leave off. Um, one of the questions that uh, uh, the question that follows this unit or that accompanies it is what might the next direction in game audio look like? And that's really an open-ended question. As I said, the technology is here. Um, I think a lot of the innovations will be how do people end up using it? Um, how is it used for VR, for example, or augmented reality? Um, what are new ways that our very advanced game sound technology can be used? Uh, and or what will be the next sort of consumer innovation of music technology? And how will that impact games and game soundtracks?